Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to Heavy Repping. My name is John Tron Davidson, and what follows is a piece entitled France, Guitar Pick's First Great Innovators, written by Joe Macy, published here in full by Heavy Repping, and in text-based form at heavyrepping.com. For more information on Vintage Picks, please follow the link in the description for Joe's YouTube channel, an interview with the man himself, and our seven-part series on the introduction to Vintage Guitar Picks. Part 1. 1880s to 1930s The French Renaissance may have ended in 1610, but three centuries later, the French spirit for originality and creativity resurfaces again in the earliest documented plectrum designs from catalogues dating back to 1907. They place France as the first great innovators in the evolution of what would later become known as the guitar pick, but for this period of time are actually mandolin picks, or médiateurs as they are called in France. Looking back at this period shows the French were entirely original, would later be copied by the American and Germans, and yet remain to this day obscure, if not unknown to most vintage guitar pick collectors. It is only by chance that their significance came to light around 2005 here in the US, but that should not be too big a surprise considering our hobby had less than a dozen vintage collectors prior to the year 2000. Italian mandolinist Ferdinand de Cristofaro, who retired to Paris as a teacher in 1879, is on record as having produced the oldest verifiable pick of any kind bar none. By category, it is the oldest known celluloid pick, the oldest artist pick, and the oldest pick bearing the name of a city, that of Paris. All these features contained in one pick. What a start for the French. The French continued to evolve pick designs, and this group of handmade pieces shows the rarest French picks known to exist just after the Cristofaro. By 1907, the Jerome Thibaville Lamy Mandolin Catalogue, abbreviated to JTL here on, had catalogue numbering for picks up to 146. US catalogues around that period offered about six designs. It is phenomenal to think that the French were that far ahead. In fairness to the Americans, the need for picks in France and Europe in general was necessitated by the mandolin's well-established popularity there ahead of its rise here in America. Larger offerings would eventually come to America, but not until the late 1920s. While only 21 picks are illustrated in the 1907 JTL catalogue, at least seven other shapes unique for this time period are seen. 34, 40, 48, 58, 88, 112 and the 128 propeller shaped pick. The bottom of the page also shows the first known corrugated picks, all made of celluloid. It's hard to imagine what the missing catalogue numbers represented in terms of design, but this was a period of obvious, intense experimentation with ideas tried, found to be lacking, then abandoned only to be quickly replaced by other designs. At least two of the JTL shapes remain in production today, the three in the US and 112 in Japan. Also making an appearance is the first known European patented pick, Le Fix, from 1902, seen at the bottom left of 113. It is not assigned a catalogue number. This unique gem of a piece is genuine tortoise shell with a riveted, ornate metal fixture for grip. Prominent US pickmaker Dandrea, established 1922, would not arrive on the scene for another 15 years, and their 1928 catalogue would show a number of the same or strikingly similar designs that are seen in the JTL catalogue. The same goes for the Germans, who also copied many of the French designs, and took a real fancy to the propeller pick, producing it in at least four different sizes in both celluloid and genuine tortoise shell up until the 1970s. There are actually very few extant JTL examples from this period, but the catalogue gives the collector a good idea of what to be on the hunt for. Here's a very tall Atlas mandolin pick from Paris, it is a lone standout that does not bear characteristics to other French picks with the Atlas brand name on them. Part 2. The Duras, Hubsons and Liscovas, 1930-1990s. to 1990s. The Duras are a very interesting group of picks that help cross the bridge between early French mandolin picks and modern French picks. They fill in the hole. Here again, the French show their creativity in giving us five entirely new shapes. New to us, that is 
They've been around for decades in France, unbeknownst to vintage collectors here in the US. Continuing to throw convention to the wind, of all the beautiful colour patterns and blends the Duras come in, none of them are offered in the standard 351 shape. While I believe there were many other non-Dura picks made by other manufacturers within France during the period between 1940 and 1970, they have yet to surface as of yet. The Duras at least establish some ground for this period. They show a lineage ranging from the 1930s going up to the mid-1990s, a period for which a huge gap existed in my own personal collection of French picks. The Duras are named as such because the seller I acquired them from informed me they were designed by an artist in that particular part of scenic eastern France that borders Switzerland. My source did not know the artist's name. I believe this mystery artist was involved in creating the artsy designs of the later Duras, especially the laminates, but not the earlier non-laminates. There are a number of subgroups within the Dura family, the names of which I arbitrarily assigned based upon what their appearance might suggest. The single factor that connects all these subgroups of picks together as a whole are two distinct shapes, small shield and large fish, that appear in the 1930s era, and also in most all of the other colour pattern variations of the 1990s era, as well as the years in between. Establishing the beginning and end period for the Duras was an easy task, but pinning down middle periods for the subgroups was far more challenging. The Roman slash surfboard picks are a shape that never appears in catalogues past the 1930s and establishes the early period. The solid colours of these surfboards also come in the small shield and large fish shapes. Shapes that occur later on in other colour pattern variations, making a direct link between the two periods. The Duras appear as standard single layer picks that account for many of the older styles, and as laminates, most of these being made later. The laminates are of several types, and unlike any other I've seen here in the US. One type is super thick, measuring over 2mm. They are constructed of a bottom layer, an ornamental middle layer, and a top finish layer. The bottom layer is usually black or white, and appears to function as the base for the middle or ornamental layer, which contains the design. On top of that is a thick, clear hard gloss protective finish. Another type is much thinner and appears to have a printed fabric that is embedded upon a bottom layer within a thin, possibly sprayed on lacquer type top finish. They can be seen in the photo with the flowers designs. As I examined them there was no reason to believe the Duras were anything other than celluloid, but just to make sure I did a nail file test by rubbing the file against the edge of the pick. This method credit to Will Hoover, preserves the overall appearance of the pick with little compromise. The result in this case, negative. No camphor smell indicative of celluloid. I suspected I was not vigorous enough in my filing and tried again with a heavier, nasty grit file that would surely rip into it a bit more. Still no camphor smell. In fact, there was no hint of any kind of smell at all. Strange. I decided it was time for more drastic measures to see what the hell this material was. Knowing I would destroy one of these pricey rare harlequins in the process of determining its composition, I felt nonetheless compelled to proceed forward, with pick in hand and lighter in the other. I put it to open flame. It stubbornly ignited and burned slowly with curly, black-streaked vapour, the smell of which was none other than rubber. I took one of the earlier solid colour 1930s pieces and tried the test again. Same result. During his 2011 visit, Brian Bouchard witnessed the same test result. This was scary, because by sight alone I would have bet a dozen surfboards that they were celluloid. I knew rubber could be blended into multi-colours, but had been well informed by reputable sources prior that nothing except celluloid could be made into something as exquisite as the Harlequins. This information has now been proven incorrect. The Harlequins have a stellar, iridescent flash to them when turned under light, each colour flashing at a different angle with a sheen usually seen only in mother-of-pearl celluloid or genuine MOP. What about the other Dura series of variations? Were they rubber too? I was not going to destroy any more of these French beauties. I actually do value my picks more than I do destroying them in the process of trying to find out what they are made of. But based on their appearance, several plastic materials seem to have been employed in their making.
There are some duros that are not laminates that qualify for the early 1990s. These include the snakeskin, similar to that used by Fender in the 90s, and vanilla fudge, which I've also seen in the recent past. The chocolate lightning strike me as older than those, and the bubblegum mosaics are most likely from the 1970s, looking somewhat, but not exactly similar to, some older Japanese mosaics from that time. The checkered and harlequins are not printed colours. The material is made that way through and through, and I suspect they are among the oldest, coming during or just after the solid colour Roman-shaped group. A number of the thicker non-laminates, such as the one in the far-right shell group, appear as though they may have been stamped with a hot, knife-edged punch. Their top edge is smooth, and the bottom edge straight-cut at 90 degrees, a far cry from more common bevelling seen by hand or from automated tumblers. Many of the laminates are not even remotely similar to any other picks I've seen from the vintage era, such as the Bloody Mary, Mixed Fizz, and Bling Blings. The mixed patterns show a bit of elementary design, some curling up at the edges, a few without full patterns and lacking the artsy appearance of those formerly mentioned. For this reason, I believe they probably came first among the laminates, as the process for manufacturing them was yet to be refined. The Hubsons, circa 1976, are entirely unrelated to the Juras. They came in the four shapes and colours as seen in the photo. The material is extruded nylon. They are a thick pick with a substantial grip pad that has a sandy texture designed as part of the moulding process. While the shapes are familiar, they are all slightly larger than their American counterparts, and the blue pick is the size and shape of a 352 on steroids. As with the case of most vintage picks, the company that made and distributed them remains unknown. They are an interesting comparison to other nylon picks, such as those made by Herco during the same era. Mysteries abound in vintage pick collecting, and the group photo of the Laskova picks are just such an example. Why would a Slovak name appear on a French-made pick in the first place? And who made them? An online post from France stated in one sentence their period of availability was the 1980s. That author provided no additional details. What is apparent are the Laskova shapes. They are the same as the Jura shapes, and from that, a safe conclusion can be made that whoever made the Juras also made the Laskova. I would suggest they span a period back to the 1970s through the 1980s, and during my first two decades of collecting, I found only one in the US. Eventually, a source in France provided me with all the remaining Laskovas seen in the photo. They have a beautiful font style, and those with a brilliant gold colour really jump out in appearance, while those with white patterns, such as the snakeskin, are appropriately paired with a black font. All of them, regardless of shape or colour style, are extremely rare to acquire, and to simply own one, can be considered a victory of a find for one's collection. All of them, regardless of shape or colour style, are extremely rare to acquire, and to simply own one can be considered a victory of a find for one's collection. Part 3. We've arrived at the final offering from France. While the main focus of my personal collection and the articles I write largely deal with vintage picks, I do collect and admire other categories, such as the various materials used to make them, artist picks, Japanese graphics and weird designs. There is a category unique among categories, the area of handcrafted picks. Unique because all other previous categories involve the use of mass production and or machinery. These picks, however, are individually designed, and usually by someone skilled in the use of tools as well as possessing an artistic sense. Eric Feuermann is a craftsman and artist living in France who seems to have no limits with any medium his hands work with. He's made picks from acrylic, glass, metal, wood, carbon fibre and crocodile skin, just to name a few. Many of his pieces have a style of their own and of his creation. Some are contemporary, while others harken back in time to what is today referred to as the steampunk genre. Until I stumbled across his steampunk creations, I had no idea what the word steampunk meant or referred to, and for the moment really didn't care either. All I knew was that Eric's steampunk picks were a pleasure to look at, each one different from the next within this genre. They had a dreamy essence. There were gears, levers, cogs and other miscellaneous small mechanical parts assembled for no practical reason, but purely for aesthetic's sake. Some are embedded entirely in acrylic, 
what others have a natural, usually exotic, wood base. As for the definition of the word steampunk, it is defined as the images surrounding the culture of real or imagined 19th century steam-powered machines from the Victorian era and how they may appear in the context of modern fantasy and science fiction writing, movies and pictures. Eric's imagination was the first to bring the world of steampunk to the form of the guitar pick. That concludes our presentation on French picks, and I hope the article shed new light into your curiosity about the obscure world of vintage pick collecting. Many thanks to the video editor John Tron Davidson, who composed the video from the article and photos he was provided by the author. He ultimately made this presentation possible for all of us to appreciate. If you would like to read this article in text-based form with accompanying photographs, please visit the link in the description or go to heavyrepping.com for more information. Many thanks to Joe for the opportunity to publish his work and for all of the articles he has submitted to Heavy Repping.